Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. We've got Don Dunn, Anthony Grimani. We're doing our weekly talk on everything you want to know about acoustics but are afraid to ask. How are you guys doing? Excellent. What's, Excellent. Up? What's up, Gargamel? All right, Jackson! Man, you, I don't have my Jackson graphic here now. You got, you caught me off guard. I got you, didn't I? I got you, didn't I? Yeah, you did. So, you know, Anthony, we've done... Um, We've done about three or four of these already on acoustics. We did bass trapping last week. The week before that, we did diffusion. The week before that, we did absorption. I think what a good point here we're at now is to, to kind of bring it all together. Tell people, you know, it, people always want to know general guidelines of where to place things to get the most bang for their buck. Um, and how do you know? Here's a question I have for you. How do you know when you've achieved good acoustical sound in your room? How do you know? whether it's through measurements or just listening, is it an art, is it a science, or is it both? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. It's a lot of that. For me, it's listening to program material that I've listened to over and over and over again for the last 20 years, the same thing. Uh, some of which I've heard in the studio, whether it's music or film material that I've actually heard in the studio in which it was recorded. And so when I get done with the whole process, design, install, calibrate, cuts with it, and I listen and I go, does this match my memory? Now, the auditory memory is not that good. A lot of people go, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. I can tell. It's like, eh, yeah, sort of. Uh, uh, auditory memory is very good if you can do a blind, you know, an A, B. But if you listen to something often enough, you you you, you get to know the textures of what's what's in the track. You get to know whether the that mid-bass is right or... I'm muted. I am muted. I'm still there. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to figure out. We're getting, like, feedback or something. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, so go Don, ahead. Can you hear Don? You you are our arbiter. Can you hear Gene and I about the same level? Yeah, you both sound good to me. Phenomenal. Excellent. Don, I think your mic is up a little hot. Is it? How about yeah. check, check, check Don, the mic? Check the mic. Don is check. hot. <laughs> um, I have to work it out, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so where I was going with this is that, you know, if you, you can trust your ears if you've been listening to the same material over and over and over and over again. Um, I also have this other little trick. I mentioned it before is I have these edemotic ear, earphones. They're expensive. They're like mm -hmm. 350 bucks, um, kind of medical grade uh, in ear, ear, you know, the early original earbud. I stick those down into my ear canal and like push them really nice and tight. And I listen to pink noise against the speakers. I listen to music that I know against the speakers and I just kind of do an AB. It's like, man, if it sounds pretty similar, I got it. And most times it's going to sound way different until you treat the acoustics, tune the room, equalize, futz with it, move speakers, do all that stuff. And once you get to that point, it's like, yep, sounds pretty close. You've, uh, you kind of won the battle. Um, so there are measurements that we spend a lot of time in designing these rooms. We spend a lot of time modeling the room. So figure out what theoretically is going to happen. Theoretically, right? It's kind of like the weather. Yeah. Theoretically, in winter, it's going to rain. And in summer, it's going to be sunny, usually. And sometimes it rains in summer. So you know, just to be totally honest, the math, the physics, the, the, the modeling works better than doing nothing. It's not always perfect. You bring it all to the room. You install it. You listen. You check it. You measure it. Uh, the measurements doing what's called impulse response tests and transfer function tests where you very precisely are looking at what the resulting room performance is yeah, and you analyze it with all these different charts and pretty pretty looking figures and you go okay that looks like it's going to work based on what the uh, science of uh, audio measurements and then you gotta listen and, so and I got I got a quick anecdotal story to tell you because I remember last week when you said you walked into some room that you thought was going to sound terrible, and it wound up sounding really good. Remember that when we talked about that? Yeah, after, after afterwards, right off off uh, off nine. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought we did it here. Okay. Um, yeah, anyway, so, so I wish we had talked about it. Uh, right, right. So you, so you can't always predict predict when a room is going to sound good. Here's a perfect example in this own, in my own Audi Hawk smart house. I set up a pair of paradigm premier 800 F's in my family room, which is just, it, it's a tile floor. I have a, a, th a throw rug on the floor. I've got a 15 foot glass slider. That's not treated yet. It's open to the kitchen. I was like, this is going to sound horrible, right? I hooked up the den and PMA 110 integrated amp, really good amplifier. I'm uh, just finished bench testing. 
And I could not believe how good those two speakers sounded in this untreated room. The bass wasn't good. The bass was a bit boomy because I was getting SBIR effects for having those speakers so close to that wall. But above about 60 hertz, above about 80 hertz, I was actually blown away by the spaciousness I was hearing. It wasn't fatiguing sound. And, and it was like one of those examples to me, like, you know what? I don't have to do a whole lot to this room to make it sound good. And it's going to sound well, really good when I get Atmos in there. I got to say, I, I was a little disappointed with those Revels. I yeah. Mean, the they sounded, I mean, I, because you know, when I met you, when I, oh, those years ago, and you said, what's your favorite speaker? I said, Revel. I mean, but those, I was like expecting magic. I mean, they're not bad, but, but um, those paradigms are pretty badass. Yeah. So you take, you take those revels in those paradigms, you move them around and the, the room's going to dominate. Just remember why I right. Yeah. Right. It, like four weeks ago, more than 50% of what you're noticing is what the room is contributing again, just because there's one tiny sliver of sound going from the speaker to your head, everything else is bouncing around. That has way bigger Agreed. effect. So I agree. can agree more. Um, I know so the we need to do that. We need to bring the rebels downstairs and put yeah. it in that same environment for sure. The, the, the folk cows like that room. They did. They Can't did. Can't the yeah. like you got from me now, judge. I mean, they loved it. So, yeah. but yeah, you're absolutely right, Anthony. Cause I've, I've sold literally the same set of tower speakers. 10 or 12 times in, in 10 or 12 different environments and got 10 or 12 different sounds from it. I mean, that's yeah. just true. Yeah. What Gene was mentioning, I was, I was telling him about this time many, many years ago where I was doing these demonstrations of a sound system and I was actually visiting a number of uh, film directors and, and, and producers, people in the industry to just show them, Hey, you know, this is what home cinema is. Now you, you got to realize that people at, in their homes are able to hear and see these pictures in all their glory. Don't imagine it's all you know, like little TVs and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I, I went to all these different rooms. Sometimes it was somebody's living room. Sometimes it was somebody's kind of dedicated media room and notice that, you know, that it was a trap case, two, actually three trap cases full of speakers, wires and everything, same system, boom, 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 you know, one, one after another, after another, completely different sounding from room to room. That's just what happens. And in this one room, uh, happened to be John Singleton. I can mention him. He's passed away, unfortunately now, completely messed up asymmetrical room. Lots of, you know, reverb sounded glorious, unbelievable. And so you, it's complicated. You can yeah. predict some of the stuff. It's complicated. You did John Singleton's theater? No, it, it wasn't. It it wasn't his theater at this time. This is before he moved from where he was. It was okay. his kind of media environment. It was like a big okay. open living space di dining room over here. So my over favorite here. director. He was great. Yeah. He's a great guy. Great guy. So Anthony, dark. can somebody, um, if somebody is going to hire you to do the acoustics of their room, can somebody take recorded measurements, um, whatever kind of file you want them to? To put it on can they take recordings of their room with a speaker in there send that to you so give you a more educated uh decision on what you're going to do in that room rather than just looking at the room and putting bass traps or putting absorption panels at randomly around yeah, the room that, that's great so if we actually start with knowing the dimensions of the room and some information about what the walls and ceiling and floor are and if somebody can do a series of measurements using i'm just going to call it this quasi inner uh, um I'm going to say quasi-universal interchange format, which is to do measurements with R, E, W. I keep bringing them up because I'm just blown away by how amazing this free software download is. Uh, download yeah. is. So you, know, you get an $80 to $100 USB mic. You plug it into your computer, your laptop. Sorry, this doesn't, by the way, this is not something you can do on a tablet. Okay, if you're serious about your audio, put away the iPad. We're over. Get a laptop. Get a computer, all right? Um, so run these measurements and we, you know, we'll describe what measurements we need. And then I, I can look at the room and I can look at the measurements, you know, just send over the files and I can see, wow, you know, it's got these problems here and there and here and there. And we can more um, it, with better education, predict what's going to happen with the room, recommend some solutions and it works more better. I like more that better. more better, so more better is good. Mo, Mo better for the AV Avengers. Mo better. <laughs> Mo better. All right. So I'm going to share the screen so you can go over, um, you know, your little slide yeah. summary of what we were talking about. And guys, uh, I'm going to put this presentation up on our Patreon at patreon.com slash audioholics. If you want to follow along um, after watching this afterward, you know, the broadcast is over. You're welcome to do that. Gene, can I just say that to the people that follow that this education is something that integrators and different people pay big money for. I mean, this for is sure. great stuff. No, I'm legit serious. It's, it's killer. It really That's is. It. 
to be fair, this is very similar to the the lectures I present at Cedia Expo, yep. ISEAS, yep. all these all these places mm -hmm. where people actually fork out. 300 bucks, 600 bucks, a thousand dollars, depending mm -hmm. on the length of the, of the course. Yeah, actually, ask me how I know. <laughs> yeah, this so, entire yeah. thing, if you'd sat through it all at the CDA courses, you, yeah, you'd be, yeah, you'd be out, whatever it is. Maybe you know Plus better travel. than I Thousand dollars. So and Audioholic is bringing all of our fans and followers absolutely phenomenal first class professional training at a, at a fraction of the price. I mean, they really yeah. are. I, Right. Absolutely. Um, yep. So good news, actually, Gene and Don. Uh, somebody emailed me this morning uh, saying, hey, I, I saw your website. You're, you're on the Audioholics website. I saw your presentations and I, I looked at the download. Um, actually, the, the downloads I've been sending already contain some of the slides of what I'm going to present today, which is after learning about all these different modules, this is all like, how does it come together? How Where do you put them? How many do you get? He said, I followed it all and I followed your recipe and I had all these treatments already and I moved them all around, took a day to change it all. And wow, it sounds so much better. Thank you. It's like, nice. Yes. Excellent. We made That's one cool. person happy, Gene and Don. Isn't that cool? <laughs> hey, it, some, it, it, it starts with on one. <laughs> it starts with one. There we go. All right. So yeah. here we go. All right. So uh, putting it all together. Um, so I am going to uh, just, you know, reiterate a little bit of what we've talked about before, which is a reminder that warning room acoustics will mess you up. You've heard this. It will mess you up a lot. And actually, you guys were talking about these Revel speakers sounding good over here. These paradigms sounding bad. No, the other way around. Revel sounding bad over here. Paradigms sounding good. These are both speakers that usually sound amazing. Um, and what's going on is the acoustical environment in which are, are messing up the speakers. So. Um, I like to think that reflections can equal to distortion, not always. Like like you said, Gene, you've got a room in which you got a lot of reflections. It's untreated, but it sounds good. You got lucky. Go get yourself a lottery ticket. Um, yes. Sometimes they're equal to distortion. And the solutions, if you have a problem, are the right combination of absorption and scattering. Most people call that diffusion. I call it kind of more generally just scatter the sound, whether it's a, a truly diffuse sound field or just to kind of re-reflect it in various directions. Now, just to be clear, drywall, bare drywall is not scattering. It's more reflecting, right? Correct. Bare drywall is like an acoustical mirror. The sound that bounces off it is what I show in this first slide. Right. Okay? And in this first slide, you know, what I'm showing is conceptually, you've got you know, three channels across the front of your home cinema, if that's what you're playing. A saxophone is played out of the center. It comes towards your ear. It also bounces off the left wall. And the two combine together slightly delayed in time. That's the main thing is it arrives a little bit later. So the saxophone goes into your, your ear canal and ear brain slightly one after the other. And it just sounds like a giant brass kazoo. Um, and that's just not the way it's supposed to sound. Now, not always. I, I'm just going to keep saying it. Sometimes it works fine. There's a bunch of factors that make that be right or wrong. <clears throat> so a bit of absorption, a bit of scattering uh, works. Now, if a bit works well, isn't more better. You know, if a bit of chocolate is good, you know, if a bit of 100% Mexican chocolate is good, you know, why not? Oh, wait, wait, wait. We can't see that. We can't see that. Let's oh, show, that, show that chocolate with pride. <laughs> If a bit of 100% cacao, chocolate, Mexicano, chocolate, Mexicano is good, why don't you just eat the whole damn thing? You know, well. So it says the skinny fuckers. <laughs> hey, good thing is this does not Talk this does not create a uh, gain weight, okay? True. Talk about here. precious energy, not chocolate. Focus. <laughs> so, um, and again, I'm just reiterating this on every session to make sure you guys get it. So if a bit of absorption, a bit of scattering, Strategically placed is good. Just why don't you just layer the whole room and and cancel all the reflections? Not good. Humans expect some amount of reflection when they're in a room of you know that their eyes actually see. Um, hey, Gene, is there a way you could put this up yes. with us as a little um, on the side? So let me let me remember how I did this. There. Yay! All right. Um, and if this can work, this will be fun. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we'll leave so it. Um, so we don't want to eliminate all, eliminate all the reflections. That's like sticking the you know sound directly into your ear. It's not that enjoyable. Plus, your eyes can see that there's a room around you, and and it makes your brain expect a some certain amount of reflections. And if none of them are there, you go into cognitive dissonance, and it's bad. So your your ear brain just goes you know question mark exclamation point um, you know whiskey tango foxtrot for the you know aviators of you. It's just not good. Um, so. We need to preserve the reflections that support the speakers, but we need to do it in a strategic way. So let's talk about that. What do we want? 
what's our goal? I always like to think of, you know, what's our goal? You get in the car, you're going to drive over to the market, you know that you're going to the market or the movie theater. What's a movie theater? Um, the <laughs> restaurant. What's a, what's a restaurant? Remember um, those back in the day? Hey, Gene, you went to a restaurant tonight. I did. Amazing. Yeah. How was that? I haven't been in a while. I mean, I, I go and I try to go in areas where it's not too close to people. And yeah, it's it's awesome. Oh, I had a, a half a pound they, burger, so I'm all meated out right now. Yeah. <laughs> are they still are they still closed out in California? Can you uh, no, they're, they're, they have it commie for me. Hey, watch what you're <laughs> saying, man. Um, <laughs> no, uh, they they are they've been reopened for a while, you know, with all of the normal. Uh, uh, but I've had I've had my first dose of vaccine, so. Yeah. Good. Good. I yeah, he's, he's craving me. human flesh soon. So. True. What do we want? What's our goal other than going to the restaurant and eating a half pound hamburger? We we ultimately want an experience in which there's a there is some kind of direct sound coming from the speaker to our to our ears, uh, like wing 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 going that way, like whoa. And then what we want is the room to support it with an even. Oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. We want the room to support that with an even envelopment of of smooth sound immersive reflections just the right amount so that it sounds engaging your your brain and your your ears like that combination so what what is that how do we get there you know that's how we get there so direct sound uh some of the reflections that would otherwise bounce around get absorbed some of them get scattered some of them get absorbed some of them get scattered you've got scattering and absorbing panels in various places that i'm about to talk about and in the end you get this combination of some direct sound and uh, reflected sound. There's the right amount of absorption and scattering. You want a smooth sound field with some good binaural dissimilarity stuff that's kind of flying around in free field around you. That's what sounds good to people. Okay, there are there are people who like a little more direct sound. There's people who like a little bit more reflected sound. And actually in concert hall acoustics, it's known that there's this sort of double hump in preferences where some people like halls where you can hear the individual instruments more and other ones where people like to hear just a big bloom of the orchestra. It's pretty much 50-50. There's a really interesting paper about well, that. Well, one thing I want to ask you too, and I don't know if we really brought this up before, is um, do you design the sidewall uh, treatments based on the dispersion characteristics of the speaker? So if you have a speaker that has a more narrow directivity, maybe you don't need to use as much absorption on the sidewalls. Yeah, ultimately, that's a good question. Uh, it, it, this, answer, this answer is in two is in two ways to look at it. The traditional way to look at these things is reflection <clears throat> decay time, which is how long does it take for the sound to decay? In reality, that's not what really matters. What's, what matters is the ratio of direct to reflected sound. And that is sometimes discussed in kind of more... Uh, uh, I would say educated esoteric acoustical uh, senses uh, or, or terms. It's more difficult to measure. It's more difficult to define. But really, what does matter is a direct or reflected sound. So, if you have speakers that are, you know, that are intentionally or or by default in terms of their radiation pattern are more directional, you don't, uh, and they are, and they are so over a broad range of frequencies, not just a small range. So mm -hmm. be careful, everybody. When somebody says my speaker has a directivity of this or that. You always have to ask over what range of frequency, because some people put like a small little horn at the top and it's like narrow only at high frequency and in the mids and lows, it's wide dispersion. Right. That's not a that's not a narrow speaker. But if you have truly a speaker that has a focused radiation horizontally and vertically, which means it's lighting up the walls less, you can definitely back off on absorbers because what you're trying to do is to get to that ratio of direct sound. So that's the sound that goes directly to you versus the reflection. Um, and sometimes when you have speakers that are two directional or, or quite directional, the, uh, the desired sense of envelopment or sweet spot can also be affected because you have enough direct sound that the relative time of arrivals are very sensitive. So there's the right balance. But um, the, in, in general, in the consumer space, most speakers have a directivity index of between six and seven, sometimes eight dB. That's just sort of a hemispherical radiating speaker over most of their range. There are some outliers that have uh, focused vertical directivity because they're big uh, line arrays mm -hmm. or planar radiators. But if you look at the broad cross section of what cells out there, you know they're they're you know typically at low frequency to mid frequency, kind of wide. They they kind of narrow up a little bit, widen up. So uh, we do look at that.
we we ask you know if it, th those of you by the way who have reached out and said hey I, you know I want your help in designing my theater most of them you've gotten a response back it's like great here's a questionnaire tell me about your room tell me about your gear and so um i without that I don't know what to say. So thanks for right. asking the question. And by the way, those of you who have responded and are waiting, you know, crickets for us to respond. Uh, there's only so many of us right now in the office. We're growing back up after COVID, but it's it's taking a little bit longer than I would uh, wish to to respond. Anyway. So Anthony, I, I got to say to you that after, you know, designing and installing many, many theaters over the years, you know, what you're doing is, is, is different. It's quite a bit different than what we've been taught and what we've been doing. And it's changed my mindset with the combination of 2d and 3d diffusion along. I mean, it, it, and it makes sense to me what, what, what you're doing. Is this something that's constantly evolving uh, as a science um, yeah. that you guys are finding out through measurements? That's a great question. That's exponentially question. different than what we did when I was THX certified yeah. 15 years ago. Yeah, so 15, 20 years ago, the stuff that I'm showing yeah. in here wasn't really very well known. Uh, so, so acoustics Torbid. has been known. How long has acoustics been known? <laughs> Quiz. Well, since the ancient days when they had amphitheaters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 2,000 years they, or more. Ancient Greeks, there, ancient Greeks did it, ancient, yeah. Ancient. Um, there's evidence uh, in, in Gothic cathedrals in Germany of Helmholtz absorbers. Helmholtz wasn't born. It, you know, it was like, 10, century, 10 centuries before Helmholtz was conceived. But there's there's these places in Germany where they've they've dug holes into the stone, created these little vessels, put some straw in there to create some uh, frequency-tuned absorbers. Jeez, that's like over a thousand years ago. Yeah, that, that's knowledge. a yeah, so there's a lot of knowledge in acoustics in in large spaces. There's a, a lot of documentation, not a lot of research. Right. Small room acoustics, the stuff that we're, we're we're interested in about, you know, for rooms up to 30 or 40 feet. So, you know, so 16. Uncharted feet. territory. That's new yeah. territory. People haven't been worrying about it because because people didn't care. Now we care. So here's a, good, here's a good question that relates. I just want to pop this up and you can answer it. Small room acoustics, which are different which are most of ours are the diffusion is not good or is it very different from scattering is diffusion different yeah. from scattering? So that's a great question. So, um, the, the term I mentioned this in, in the, in the course, you know, two weeks ago on, on scattering devices, what is the difference between the, in, in the term of art, like in the language of it, what is the difference between diffusion coefficient and scattering coefficient? So let's just generally call it scattering, which is sound hits a surface and it's re-radiated in all directions and call that scattering. Um, so you thought they were not good. There, there are statements that say that quadratic or, or um, phase linear or phase, phase linear, phase arrays close to your ear can cause problems. So if you're if you're sitting on on in a seat and there's diffuser panels of a certain type, the, the particular type that have all these little wells this way, sometimes that don't sound so good in proper Americanish because you're too close to the panels for the the phase scattering to work. So yes, small rooms uh, sound way better with scattering uh, devices, but you really want to make sure that there's some distance to you, or you want to use the right type of devices. So thanks for bringing that up. Gotcha. And, for more on that, go back to the session on on uh, diffusers or scattering. Yeah, this is in an acoustics playlist. If you go to the Audio Hawks uh, YouTube channel, hit the playlist. All of the room acoustics seminars with Anthony are available there. Right. It, is, it is absolutely invaluable information. It truly is. I mean, as a professional, it's put me on my ear. I mean, I'm, I, you know, part of being a, a a true professional is always evolve, and you know, this involvement with Anthony has just opened my eyes to a bunch of things. I mean, it's phenomenal. Cool. I'm glad, glad to hear that. Um, so this is the this is a target. What here's the recipe. Here's how you put together, you know, the absolutely perfect chicken cacciatore um, mm. of, of acoustics. Mm. So um, in simple terms, go get yourself 15% of absorption surface, put those in the pot, uh, distribute them evenly in order to lower the reflected energy in the room. Not much more than that in most rooms. Bigger rooms take a little more than 15%. Smaller rooms take a little less. Now, when you say 15%, are you just counting the side and back and front walls or are you counting the ceiling as well? Yeah, and I'll show you that. You know, just just add up all the walls. So, so front, left, right, back, and ceiling, uh, maybe even the floor. In other words, don't be applying more than 15, at most 20% 
of or, or don't convert more than 20 percent uh, of the surface you're seeing into absorptive materials it's going right. to be too dead and by being too dead a bunch of things start to fall apart um, the other part of the recipe you know the other thing you have to go into the pantry and grab is a bunch of scattering devices i'm calling it diffusion surface i could call it scattering surface another 15 to 20 percent some of these presentations show 20 some of the show 15 whatever somewhere in that region and I generally find that interleaving them with, with absorption. So not all the absorbers in one place, not all the diffusers in another place, but interleaving them works really well. And then there's what I call 2D diffusers towards the front, 3D diffusers towards the back works well. In some rooms, it's not that, that way, but generally that works. And what I call 2D diffuser, I'll bring up, it's, it's a diffuser that changes the incoming sound into a hemi disc, just a plane of surface. And 3D, I call that a diffuser that converts the incoming energy into a hemisphere. Uh, as in, I don't, again, just for those of you who are used to the terms of D as being the quadratic residue value, uh, that's not what I'm using. I'm using the, 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 the geometric character of the scattered surface. And those things improve the spaciousness. They give you the sense that you're not in a room that's 20 by 16 by nine, but instead it feels like the room has grown bigger than where the walls are because it, it actually plays a little sleight of hand. It actually cons your ear brain into feeling like a room is bigger. So you can actually believe you're in the F Vienna Philharmonic if that's what you're supposed to believe. So let's put it all together. Um, so, to, to decide what you need. So let's go, let's go beyond this really simple recipe of 1515. Let's talk about reflection decay time. Uh, reflection decay time is what happens after there's a first sound that hits you and there's a bunch of bounces around. Um, and as the sound bounces around, it loses energy. And after a certain time, what's remaining in the room is 60 de decibels lower than what the direct sound impulse was. Uh, 40 dB is 1%. So you've lost 99% by the time you get to, to, to 40 dB down. Another 20 dB down is another uh, 0.1. So point, you're getting down to 0.1% of the original signal. There's, you, know, you don't hear anything. That's the term often used by acousticians to describe how much reflection is in a room is this time. Like I said earlier, in small rooms, what's more important is the ratio of direct to reflected sound, but it's just described in time. So we'll, we'll use that legacy. And what matters is that the decay time and spectrum should be just right. Not too much, not too little. The balance of it should be right so that in the end you, you go, wow, that sounds really good. So um, here's what it should look like first on a, on a time domain. If you actually were to look at the sound as it hits your ear and then there's another reflection, another reflection, and if it was an impulse, something like a hand clap, over time, ideally a room in which you can actually take the, you can actually create an acoustical environment where there's a direct sound that hits you and then there's a bounce attenuated somewhat from the walls, from the floor, from the ceiling, and then other bounces and other bounces and they're scattered evenly through time to where the decay is even. You could draw a straight line or a quasi straight line. That is a room that sounds good. So Gene, when you were asking me before, Hey, is there a way through some measurements that you can tell? It's like, well, yeah, if you, you send me yeah. an impulse response measurement using REW, there's many other tools, by the way, but that's just an easy universal. Mm -hmm. that, that chart right there truly sums it up. I mean, that is phenomenal. That's what you want. And, and that's uh, also what you want in good concert halls and things like that. If there's a grouping uh, in certain places where there's like multiple bounces that come around from a place and hit you, it, that, that just doesn't sound so good. So um, quick question for you, because I keep seeing this popping up on our chat here. People are wondering about the SBIR effect of a speaker being uh, uh, being placed close to the front wall. Uh, we talked about this in the last session with the bass trap stuff and putting absorption there. Is this something that that's measurable via amplitude response? Or is this something that you do in a time domain when you're trying to give people advice on how to fix these kind of problems when they have a speaker really close to the front wall? Yeah, that's that's a little bit outside the scope of what I'm covering today, but I'll mention it. A uh, if a speaker is close to a boundary, or worse, close to two boundaries that have the same return causing a cancellation, which is like a worst case or three boundaries, you're going to see it right away in the steady state response with pink noise, or 
uh, pseudo random pink noise and, a, and an FFT analysis. You're going to see in the time domain also, but you, you don't need very sophisticated equipment to see that, hey, man, there's like, there's like a major dip in the frequency response, and that's not going to sound good. Mm -hmm. It is a time event. It is a thing that, you know, the speaker sounding sound, sending waves to you, and then it's reflecting off a surface and coming back later. And the place at which those two waves are out of phase with each other, there's a cancellation. They suck They're constructively out. interfering, basically. Right. So it is a matter of time. It's visible in the frequency domain. Um, interestingly, in the math of audio and waves, we often switch back and forth between time and frequency. And there's a thing called the Fourier transformer or the, the Laplace transform in math that actually allows us to mm -hmm. convert from one to the other. But you really want to be able to think in both domains. So... All right, let's talk about what you should get to. Uh, again, e even though what I wish I, we could talk about is re direct to reflected ratios, and, and at some point maybe we'll get far enough in the so in the conversation on acoustics amongst people to be able to talk about that. Right now, everything's sort of limited to this thing of decay time. Sorry, but the ideally what you want is to put in most of the rooms for most of the people who are listening here ideally you put an impulsive sound in the room it should bounce around for somewhere around 0.3 seconds before it just dies out 0.2 for smaller rooms 0.4 for larger rooms maybe 0.5 for really big rooms but that's sort of the target and what's interesting is I'm, there's always going to be somebody listening who's like well i like it more this way or that way it's like well you do but these numbers actually come from a body of your research done almost 30 years ago now, 25 or 30 years ago, where, where a bunch of people were put into a bunch of different rooms using a bunch of different acoustical parameters and were asked, hey, do you like this better or do you like that better? And so uh, statistically over a few years of work, there was there was a, uh, you know, a, a, a bunch of data that said, hey, most people like it kind of like that. That particular body of research was expecting to find the ideal reverb time for a room. And it found that it depended on the room volume, how big the room is. Um, and it also found a very strong statistical value to it. So it's not like everybody was sharply all in one camp. There's people that were down the slope, you know, some people there were one sigma, two sigmas away, but most people tended to prefer about the same amount of time given a certain room. And you go, how's that possible? It's like, well, I think it just comes down to the fact that from a point at which we're a small, you know, little bambino, that's Italian for baby, um, mm -hmm. We, we, you know, we're in a room and we listen for where mom and dad is and we, our brain gets trained through fuzzy logic to see like the boundaries and see how much reverb is in the room. And that's just what makes sense. So but fuzzy logic. I haven't heard that in a while. Fuzzy logic. <laughs> it's an educated it's an old AV term. Um, so this group of super intelligent guys um, came up. So they did all this research and then they charted you know, the typical statistical values given different room volumes and found what's called an empirically fitting curve. And they said that, hey, if you're if you're in the old if you're in the imperial system, you know, the one with the kings and queens, if you want to know what the target decay time of the room should be so that when you put up speakers, you go, well, that sounds great. It should be this. You you figure out the volume of the room, which is the length, width and height. Multiply those by each other. You divide that number by three thousand five hundred and thirty two. You take the cube root of that, not the square root, but the cube root, which on most calculators, you know, those things that you used to have when you were in school a long time ago. Um, or you can do that on your phone or your computer. right here. My HP. There it is. You still have it. Is that still the uh, original I, batteries? I love it. No, it's just uh, there's triple A. Triple. I can't I can't live without this calculator. Reverse yeah. Polish notation. Yeah. What a dork. Reverse exactly. He is really dorky. Um, <laughs> so uh, you take the volume of the room, you divide by 3,532, you take the cube root of that, you multiply by 0.3, and that's your target decay time um, for what will mean that most people, when you're listening to typical speakers, are going to go, yeah, that sounds really nice. You know, when I'm listening to solo guitar, it sounds good. Orchestral music sounds good. Nine Inch Nail sounds good. Bach sounds good. I, I like it. Thank you very much. Um, and so for shits and giggles, if anybody's, you know, curious out, that, out there and you take a room that's around 3,000 cubic feet, which is... Um, I think 22 by 16 by 9 or 10, you multiply those three together, you'll you'll find a value somewhere around 3,000. You 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 take that volume divided by 3,532, it's close to one, cube root of one is one, multiply by 0.3, you get to 0.3 seconds. 
Now, in the metric system, the newer and better one from Europe, the French invented that. Yeah, one good thing they invented, along with uh, wine, cheese, and uh, a few other things. Um, the word surrender. The, the, <laughs> the word surrender. Uh, they did do that, didn't they? Um, so uh, in that same world, the, the, of course, the equation is different. You divide by 100. So, so look at that. You can just divide by 100. That's a lot easier than 3,532. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the deal. Handy rule of thumb. I'm going to keep repeating it. If you take a room and you cover it with about 15% of surface uh, of absorption, you're going to get to this without having to do too much math. So you could chart this. It's actually not a linear relationship, but I've just charted it to go, hey, if the room volume gets larger, the decay time should get longer. And that's because you just come to expect that from a larger room. Now, that's not all. Uh, you want that decay time to be the same at all frequencies, ideally. So whether it's 1,000 hertz or 2,000 hertz or 10,000 hertz or 100 hertz, um, which is, you know, hertz is not a place where you go rent a car, but it's actually a measure of the, the frequency. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> um, and ideally, you want it about the same. So you put sound into the room and you want the, the room to return sound to you evenly. Um, and there's some matter of debate on that. There's some people who like it with a little bit longer decay time at the low frequency. So the room sounds a little warmer. Some people like it the other way around. I built rooms both ways. And I will, I will say that rooms that have a drop off at the low frequency where that they're over absorbed. So be careful, you can't over absorb the bass, tend to sound bass shy. And you can compensate by turning up the bass during equalization, and it sounds fine. But there is something about a little bit of extra decay time at the low frequency, like to bring up the French again, a certain je ne sais quoi. Mm -hmm. um, so um, what I'm shown here is a, a tolerable variation of a frequency. So if you're targeting 0.3 seconds because you have a room that's around 3,500 cubic feet um, in the mid frequency, it is okay for that decay time to rise up by 100%. So go all the way to 0. 0.6 seconds and it's uh, on the low frequency. And it's okay for it to, to drop off at higher frequencies by up to 50% drop. So to go down to 0. 0.15 seconds without anybody going, oh my God, that sounds horrible. So while it is, while it is better to try to keep it smooth or maybe a tiny bit of extra tilt in the time in the bottom end, you don't have to over obsess over it, okay? So um, getting it right, how do you get there? Well, you, run, you want to use the right amount of absorption for the mids and highs using typically frictional materials. So I talked about this in the session on absorption several weeks ago. You want to, write, you want to use the right amount of base absorption, which is either thick frictional devices or other uh, base traps using either tympanic membranes, perforated membranes, um, Helmholtz resonators, and the other stuff I talked about last week, right? Um, and then you want to, what's the right amount? Well, 15. the right amount is 15%. But if you want to get scientific about it, you can calculate it using one of these three equations. They're known as the Sabine equation, uh, the Eyring equation, or arao Pushades equation. So in order to do that, you need to know the dimensions of the room and you need to know the absorption coefficients of the materials you want to use. So the manufacturer would actually have to give you charts and data of, of the real absorption coefficient as they measured it in a real chamber. And you got to be prepared to do a lot of math. So here's what it looks like. The Sabine equation is good but old. It's um, from around the 30s, but here's the equation. And this basically says that the predicted reflection decay time to 60 dB is 0.049, the volume in cubic feet, divided by the total surface area and the absorption coefficient. So if you know all this stuff, you can put it in the, in the equation, shake it up, use your reverse Polish uh, calculator, do all that stuff, drink a little coffee, you know, eat a little chocolate, <laughs> and you'll find out if you're getting to where you're supposed to go. Um, a little newer from the 50s, the Eyring equation uh, takes it a step further, which is it, it it's very similar to the, the Sabine equation, but rather than look at it in terms of total surface area, it looks, it looks at sort of the ratio. So it's the same 0.049 volume of the room in cubic feet, and there's a different coefficient for the room in, in metric. Um, but then you divide it by the, um, the total surface area and the natural log of one minus the area weighted absorption coefficient. So if your absorption coefficient of a material is one and you're putting 15%, that would be 0.15. And then, so, 
Go Can ahead. I hijack you real quick, Anthony? I'm sorry. So for a knuckle dragger like me, so if somebody has a family room where, or a great room, and they have a hallway and they have a kitchen or opens to another area, is that the volume that needs to be calculated into That's, the equation as well? You want to look at or that whole there? thing. The sound's bouncing around all over that. Right. Now, so everywhere. Always. Okay. Just want to, so for, um, for the listeners, I want to clear that so, up. So then more, more recently, 70s, 80s, uh, a researcher mm -hmm. out of, uh, I believe, uh, the Catalonia, if I remember right, which is not Spain. It's different. It is in Spain, but it, you know the Catalans think of themselves differently. Called the Rao Pushadis, um, took essentially the I ring equation and said, you know, it's better to break this into the three axes: the length, width, and height of the room, and calculate it, calculate that um, across all three of these axes because you may have a different character along the width, the length, and the height. And you can do this, and you just do that. And when we when we run calculations in our model, we actually run this equation. And guess what? It almost explodes Excel. It actually almost has so many factors as you start to try different absorb absorber materials that you get to the maximum length of what Excel can tolerate. That's a lot. You got to use MATLAB at that point. You got to go to MATLAB, absolutely. So, um, or you can just use this equation: fifteen percent of the wall <laughs> surfaces with absorption. Because I, you know, how did I come up with fifteen percent after the first twenty or thirty rooms where we started to look at, you know, how much it was, and we did a like, well, how is this on average? Where is it? We found we detected a trend, like they say in science, that, you know, most times if we start with that weighted area um, ratio over here as 0.15, it lands right to the target. That was in the other equation of where we were trying to go, like 0.3 seconds or 0.25 or 0.35, depending on the room volume. So the good news, you know, so I'm an engineer. I do math. I do physics. But I find myself looking at this equation. I find this like tightening in my chest. Too much chocolate hmm. or just too much math? What do you think? It's always good to have a rule. It's always good to have a rule of thumb when it works. <laughs> Absolutely. Actually, the best science is done when... Before you start to do all the math, you already kind of know what to expect. So that if you made a mistake and the answer is a thousand when you were thinking it was going to be 10, you're like, no, 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 I, I, something's wrong here. So the good news is you can all mellow out. It's all okay. If you you know do around 15% of the wall surfaces with absorption, 15% with diffusion or scattering, you'll be fine. And in diffusion, 2D towards the front, 3D towards the back. I keep saying that. I will explain that in a slide that's coming. Generally speaking, don't group all the absorbers in one place. Spread them around the room. That is what works better for lots of reasons. I don't really have time to get into it. And generally speaking, I have found that interleaving the absorbers and the diffusers works well, which is sort of different. If you look back at the kind of the approaches and theories from probably 20 or 30 years ago, they, they wouldn't have done that. They would have grouped those things more. And I've tried, I've tried it this way. I've tried it that way. I have three drawers. Of, I have these big file cabinets full of of uh, papers from various conferences of on just this stuff. And, you know, a bunch of people have researched it and generally speaking, it's better to interleave it. Now, I've also found that asymmetrical layouts work better in which when you look at the left wall where there's an absorber isn't exactly where there's an absorber on the right wall, maybe they're slightly offset. And I know there's a lot of controversy around that. Even mm -hmm. right here with an audio yeah. hall. Get I don't believe it until I hear from this. <laughs> totally. I'm having a hard time with that one myself, yeah. Anthony. And and I, I'm just going to say it can be better. The the cool thing is that you can you can try it. You know you can do it this way and that way. And mm -hmm. if you if you mount things on the walls or initially temporarily using command adhesive, which is an amazing thing that you can put on your walls, it'll hold a little a few pounds. And try it one way, try it the other. You can see what works better for you. And what works better, what I mean by better, is Left and right speakers give you a nice, clean phantom center when there's st stuff in the middle and a kind of a nice diffuse surround, uh, surrounding character. One, number two, dialogue is nice and clear. Number three, the integration of the front sound field to the side to the back is good. Try it out. Listen to program material. So if you're going to compare uh, the asymmetry versus symmetric layout, it's probably you're going to notice a bigger difference if you just do it in two channel, right? Because it's going to get too confusing yeah. when you have all your speakers going yeah. at once. A absolutely. Yeah, that's a very good point. Two channel is the most sensitive to all of this. Two mm -hmm. channel is a very fragile process. And and uh, I know way too many people that have paid hundreds of thousands of dollars on two channel gear and are sitting in rooms without acoustical treatments and they're not hearing what the gear can do. Right. Um, and so, Gene, 
the good news is that with multi-channel sound, you know, with high high channel count, maybe you don't need to be as obsessive about the acoustics to get, you know, what we're looking for, which is sense around around a sound. Um, but in two channel, it's really fragile. So um, don't forget to treat the ceiling. Uh, in the ceiling, it's mainly the first, you know, first reflection is important. Um, and just remember that generally diffusion does smooth out the decay of the room. So we're we're not only looking for a certain decay time, but we're looking for it to be a smooth decay, not like chaotic. Um, so we got a quick super chat. I just wanted to see if you gave an answer to um, from John Lim. His home theater room is 15% absorbers, no diffusers. His RT60 is over 200 milliseconds, too damped, too dead. The room is 13 by 19 by eight. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm almost going to say, do the math, multiply 13 by 19 by eight. Gene, with your reverse Polish calculator, uh -oh. you're going to do that while I talk. 13 by 19 by 8. Okay. Multiply that. Divide by 35, 32. Um, and then take the cube root of that. Multiply by 0.3. Give us the value. 200 milliseconds sounds about right for that size room. Maybe it's 0.25. What I'm going to ask in return is how did you measure that? Did you measure that with a dodecahedron? Big new word of the day. Dodecahedron, oh, which is... Yeah a speaker that emits sound in all directions or with your, your regular speaker firing at you. Um, the difference between the two is that in one case, you're radiating the whole room and the other case, you're only radiating forward. And so you may, if you're measuring 200 milliseconds using REW and your front firing speakers with a dodecahedron, you may measure 0.25. All this math is based on dodecahedrons, uh, which you could go, well, who's got a dodecahedron? Well, yeah, it, you know, if we get to the point where we're arguing over uh, 50 milliseconds of decay time, life is good. What was that after the cubert? What do you multiply by? Uh, 0.3. I must have messed up because I got 0.991. I don't think I'm doing the cube root right on this calculator. Okay. I haven't used cube root, cubed roots on this in a long time. So, Okay, so... I'm going to go to my non-reverse Polish. We're po we're pausing the whole show here for John. I know, no, we could do that. We could oh, do right. that afterwards. So yeah. 19 by uh, 13 by 9 is, e is equal to 2,641. I divide by 3531. And yep, then I take that. the cube root of that. That's 15 times 0. 0.3, 52. Uh-oh, I did it wrong too. Sorry, 19 by 13 by 9. I honestly have to look up where the cube root function is on this calculator. I can't find it. <laughs> That's funny. Is that an old Texas Instruments calculator? So the, no, the, HP. It's funny. The target, oh, like, according to my Apple device over here, this would be the target, 0.26. Okay. Uh, which is about what I expect for that size room. You're measuring 0 0.2. Is that because you're... Is that because you got a big big carpet on the floor? Is that because you got a big overstuffed couch, which people have, or is that and or is that because you're measuring with uh, with a front firing speaker and therefore not lighting up all of the rooms? So mm. John, let us know. We'll we'll keep going. Thanks for that question. That's great. Um, so the other things about getting it right is don't forget base absorption. So so some people you know take this advice and they put one inch or two inch panels on the walls as 25 or 50 millimeters and they go, well, I don't know, it doesn't sound so good. It sounds kind of thick. It's like, well, you, you're not treating your base. Remember from my session on absorption months ago, no, weeks ago, that you, you need to go thick enough to carry the entire uh, range and that would be at least four or five inches, which is, you know, at least 10 centimeters, 15 centimeters, or add some mid mid base absorbers. So let's look at that. Um, I'm kind of rushing because we're getting in again into a 15 minute point. I'm trying to get this done in 45 minutes, so I'm already over. Uh, and I've got a bunch of really cool diagrams coming on. So as a reminder, diffusion does enhance the room, but it also enhances the effective effectiveness of absorbers. What the hell? So if you have a room that just has absorbers, the sound hits those when it happens to hit that place in the wall. If you also put scattering devices, it spreads out the sound. So there's more chance that in the free field and the statistical radiation of all the air molecules, they'll find an absorber somewhere. So as you start to add diffusers, your, re your reverb time could actually go down. So John, if you put some diffusers in your room and you, you remeasure, you may find that your RDT, reflection decay time, goes down to 0.18. So you can back off on the absorbers. Um, so um i'm gonna skip this because we're out of time let's do this this is the 
core recipe that I always go to. And this is not the only way to do it. It's just a good first, first approximation. So this is a room scene from the top. We're going to talk about um, uh, sound coming out of a center speaker, but the left speaker, the right speaker, all of that could be the same. We're going to talk about putting some panels on the ceiling, some diffusers on the walls, some absorbers on the walls, some 3D diffusers, all of this stuff. So let's let's go to it. So first in my recipe, I'm going to suggest putting some absorbers on the wall. In this case, this let's just say this room is around 20 feet long, so six meters long. We're going to put three panels that are two foot by four feet. That's 60 by 120 centimeters. And and you take those panels and you try to go, well, is that 15%? Let's take all of them. Let's jam them down here in the corner and look at that relative to the room. So if we filled the bottom half of the room, that'd be 50%. If we filled one quarter, that'd be 25%. This is more like, you know, 15, 20%, uh, 15 to 18%. So let's put these things back on the wall. That's kind of where I recommend putting them, which sometimes I kind of surprise. You kind of, they're sparsely located. Mm -hmm. That, if you put that on the left wall, that on the right wall, that on the back, that's enough absorption. Now, now you want the height to be with, you know, within the tweeter axis. So you want sym symmetry uh, above and below the tweeter axis, right? Yeah, sort of. You can, uh, it, it's not so much the tweeter. Uh, it's really the room. So I, I usually like to put them kind of in the middle of the room. Um, and this is maybe not totally representative of what I like, but if a room is eight oh, so it's symmetry for the, the the height of the wall. Yeah, and I guess here it might didn't draw this quite right. I would I would normally put these about two feet up from the floor, sixty centimeters, and you got one hundred and twenty centimeters. And then it goes up. If the room's really tall, you may want to raise them up. Not that important. You you could try moving them up and down. And it'll go. Yeah, it doesn't really make a very big difference. So. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to add 2D diffusers. Okay, we got our absorbers. We, we're going to add some 2D diffusers, and I'm going to recommend putting those towards the front. Again, what I call a 2D diffuser is a device that takes the incoming sound and turns it into a play, uh, a plane, a hemi disc, half of a disc. Um, and what we have now on the wall is some absorbers. I forgot to talk about the base absorbers. I'm actually kind of keeping that for later. Let's just just think that we're putting them in the corners, maybe towards the end of the room. I'll get back to that. So we've got absorbers. We're going to add some 2D diffusers interleaved with that. And then we're going to interleave some 3D diffusers on our left wall. 3D diffusers, again, being something that the sound hits it and it gets scattered back out hemispherically, both horizontally and vertically. Okay. That's, that's the beginning of a recipe for the left wall. Now, most people, when they see a picture of that, they go, oh my God, the whole room is treated. It's stuff everywhere. It's like, well, it is. It's three panels of absorption that cover about 15% and uh, and six panels of half of the side that cover the other 15%. And I know it looks like a lot, but it's only 30% of the total surface area here. This, by the way, in case you wanted to understand, is the screen. There's a speaker over here that's a front speaker, and that's a surround speaker. I've generically put a wood surface on there. All right. The right wall, do the same thing. Absorbers, placed around the room, interleaved with diffusers, some 2D here towards the front, 3D towards the back. If you got a door, put a, a, an absorber on the door. If you're worried about it being too thick, put a thinner absorber. Um, so now, Anthony, you have those side speakers above seated ear level position. Um, that could be a challenge for people that are doing Atmos and maybe they only have eight foot ceilings and they want to have good height separation between the <laughs> ear level speakers and the height speakers. What do you recommend there? Yeah, this is very schematic. It's very schematic. So. Um, typically, typically no, know that the, the side speakers and back speakers are listened to and designed to be heard at about 15 degrees up from your seated ear height. That's mm -hmm. what's been done in movie theaters for, forever. And a lot of people comment that if you bring them down, they get more audible, but they kind of get annoying. Like every time there's an effect True. there, you, you're like, mm, okay, 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 stop, turn them down. Too, too I localized. Like the your, too I local. don't like the sound of your for sides yeah. and rears. I know. And some for people like it. You know, it's the none of this is 100 percent, but most people tend to like the sure. the effects you get from kind of spatializing it up a little bit. So in if you wanted to lower that speaker a little bit, well, lower the panel or cut the panel down, what whatever it takes. Right. Right. So, yeah, thanks for asking that. So now uh, that's the left and right wall. Now, uh, again, here, just to prove it to you on on the um, on the right wall, I, I took those four panels, put them on the floor. So you get a, you know, a visual of it that it's not filling up the whole room. Now the back wall, 
It's also a subject of a lot of controversy over the years. On the back wall, I really like to put absorbers in the middle of the back wall. Yep. And that's to get rid of the of an axis, the axis of evil, the uh, e axis of sound radiation from front to back that tends to hit your two ears at the same time. Every time it goes back and forth and tends to narrow up the sound. So just the stuff that passes your head and hits the back wall, it should just be sucked out. Two, two or three panels of, of absorbers and two foot by four foot, 60 by 120 is, is what works in most rooms. And then off to the sides, some 3D diffusers, maybe some 2D, two or 3D diffusers up higher so that the sound that passes your head off axis kind of disappears in that direction, bounces around the room back over there and returns after it's kind of filled up the the immersive part of the room from behind you. This so this so one point to to mention is I I do a lot of consulting on the side for people that are setting up home theaters. I would say about seventy percent of them have to put that couch on that back wall, which is the worst place to put a seat because now you're too close yeah. to a back speaker. You're at a pressure yeah. maximum, and yeah. you're getting all those bad reflections that you're talking about. So what do you do in that case where you have to put the couch on the back wall? Do you still want to put absorption above the listener? What do you what are you uh, going to do? E even more. Absolutely. That's like even the worst. So first thing I do is I, I, I try to raise awareness, which is like, is there any way we could push this couch forward a little bit, please? Like a few couple feet. of feet. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, rarely, you know rarely, rarely in the real world. Can you do that? Yeah. But, and, and every six inches is going to make a big difference from a point of view of base quality and envelopment. Right. You know, you cannot be enveloped by speakers if they're like right here. You, you, yep. need it, you, you know, this is being enveloped, not right there. If you can't, well, please do put as much as possible a four inch thick panel behind you so that the sound that passes your ear and would otherwise bounce back with just a short slap just gets killed. Yep. Okay. Um, and I know it may not look good, whatever, just whatever you got to do. If, you know, if, if sound is important, you will find a way, I guess. Well, there's decorative options that you guys offer too. Right. So right. Or, you can, you can make that. Make a in ceiling back speakers too. So you can no, know that the design of the back channels was to make sound come from behind you. Um, when Gary Reitstrom was working on the sound design of Phantom Menace, and I was working at THX, he came to me and he's like, I want to find a way so that we can have front sounds, side sounds, and back sounds more precisely than in 5.1. And it's like, well, what do you mean by back sounds? I want to be able to you know, take a spaceship or the, 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 the pods, all this stuff, and I just want it to go like behind. If, if you put it above you, it's not quite what was intended sometimes mm -hmm. that's the only thing you can do but that was not really the intended thing sometimes it's better not to even try to do seven channel sound when you're right up against the back wall you you actually may end up with more of a mess than trying yeah, 5.1 okay. sometimes reflect that sound off the wall yep yep reflect the sound off the wall maybe it can work so now i i said i'm gonna i was gonna keep the low frequency absorption a little bit for later so i've talked about absorbers diffusers um, and generally, I, I want to remind you that low frequency absorbers have two purposes. One is to control the decay time, that thing that the sound is bouncing around the room, you know, down in frequency, not just where the regular wall panels catch it down to, you know, 500, 600, 700 hertz, but continue on down so that the, the overall reflection decay time is a smooth line over time. So that's one purpose. And for that, um, how do you do that? Well, you, about 10 to 15 percent of of panels that are known to absorb low frequency you can the good news is you can pretty much put them anywhere you want in the room because low frequencies kind of roll like big waves they don't really bounce off where you need to you know you need to put them specifically located so maybe you can put those uh, low, low frequency absorbers could go you know hello they could go here they could go there they could go on the front wall the back wall wherever you have room and there's another really cool place to put them I'll get to in a second. The other purpose of low frequency absorbers is to control standing waves, which is a completely different thing. Talked about all of that last week. I'm not going to go over it. But they those are best put in the corners because that's where the, the standing waves are the most active. Okay? So standing waves are these resonances that go back and forth between the front and back wall, left and right wall, ceiling and floor. And at the corners is where they tend to pile up. Now, for interesting chaotic reasons... In many rooms, some corners are more active than others, where putting an absorber, an, an actual pressure sensitive absorber, like I talked about last week, will have better efficacy by putting it in this corner than that corner. How do you know which corner? Put a microphone there, measure the base. 
or, you know, bring your ears with you, you know, just tell them, hey, come along and listen to program material or pink noise. Go to the four corners of the room and you'll find one that's like, man, it's really loud here. That's a really good place to put some form of bass trap, something that that has a membrane in front. It's going to work a whole lot better than in a, in, in a corner where there's little energy. And check if it's a rectangular room, check all eight corners. If it's not a rectangular room, you may have more corners you got to check. So generally speaking, remember that standing waves create these nulls and um, putting an absorber panel, if you wanted to put a thin absorber panel to get rid of a standing wave, a frictional absorber, you'd have to put it right in that null. That's just impractical. Uh, that will reduce the standing wave, but it's not very practical. It's better to put pressure sensitive devices into the corner of the room. Now, here's a cool trick. Those of you who have theaters or listening rooms or whatever that, that actually has a have a, a riser platform. That riser platform is um, is an area that is often just built up out of wood and is closed. Well, that's a pity because you have this nice, big, deep, eight inches, 10 inches, 12 inches uh, device that you could stuff a bunch of fiberglass, rock wool, foam, whatever you want to put in there, and then, and then perforate some areas of the top to turn it into a big low frequency absorber. Yeah, in fact, we, we should just, do. Wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> we just we just what? finished building the one in my theater room, basically, and we did uh, two by eights on the perimeters, two by sixes on the center beams. So there's air gaps between the bays, filled up yeah. with sixty percent um, fiberglass, and then we put ports at the rear, where right. the pressure maximum of the room is. All right. So I don't I, know how it's going to measure. That's going to be interesting to measure because it's not. Well, you know, the, very the cool precise. thing is. The cool thing is if it's not measuring right, you can start to perforate other places. Generally, what, I, what I've what i done, and it, did, it doesn't render here, I can see this. Generally, I don't, I don't perforate more than 50% of it because then it's too much base absorption and your decay time at the low frequency start to, starts to dip down. That doesn't sound so good. So I tend to perforate 30 to 50% of it in the right perforation pattern, depending on the room resonances, you know either directly under the seating or towards the back. So it's a little closer to the pressure centers. But really what, what we're building here is a big damped low frequency absorber, not so much of a frequency selective trap, but something that's just deep and big and has its main region of function at low frequency. It is the perforations that are gonna filter out the mids and highs and only let the base in to be absorbed. So it's, it's a, I call it a base filter, all right? So, the results of all that just kind of go back to our little diagram. When it's all working right, you got a direct sound, you got reflected sounds, some of which are absorbed, some of which are scattered. Some of the scattering is on a horizontal plane, and it's really good for that horizontal plane to happen uh, between the speakers and you in the kind of frontal part of your head. That's what sounds good for music, and it's good for more of a scattering above, you know, the, the upper area of your head to be behind you and above you. That's what matches more what concert halls sound like and also matches more what our, our expectations of how sound is in real life. So this is what you get from this recipe, okay? It's one way to get there, uh, which in the end is this, this thing that I, I call the nice buttery croissant, butter croissant of sound, maybe even with some oh. croissant au chocolat, actually, pain au mm. chocolat is what they call it in French. So, uh, man, now I'm hungry. Um, okay. Finally, all this stuff. Uh, here's what a rendering of a layout scheme could look like that. So you, you go, it's a lot of stuff on the walls. Well, you know, it's, yes, no, whatever. If it's a dedicated room, it's okay. Um, so you have some speakers over here. You have some low frequency absorbers over here. Absorber, 2D diffuser, absorber, 3D diffuser. Up above, some absorbers in that first reflection point off the ceiling and some 3D diffusers behind you. That's kind of what it could look like. And you can, from different vendors, make these things in different forms and different colors. You know, my my company, Sonatus, or the, the company I formed to import and distribute this amazing product from Croatia, of all places, called Sonatus Acoustics, has some of them. But to be fair to all of my brethren that talk about acoustics, which I consider them all colleagues, not competitors, there's a lot of cool stuff out there. Get the absorption and diffusion coefficients for them. You know, look at it. Um, this is a, uh, this is our premium system. This is our ultra system in which we use wood instead of synthetic materials. Uh, looks a whole lot better. Works a little bit better. It's just it looks it just looks more luxurious. Same concept though. Absorbers, diffusers sc scattered around the room. Uh, this is what a full diagram of a room that would be 350 square feet. That's 35 square meters would look like with all the treatments. And there's people who would go, whoa. I'm not doing that in my room. Mm -hmm. oh, 
yeah, it's it could look kind of big, but if you do walls that are dark gray for a good video and you do panels that are black or gray or dark tone, it all kind of melds in there. If you do blue with blue or red with red, it kind of, it can sort of meld into it. So um, this is what it would look like in a room that's 65 square meters, 650 square feet. More absorbers, same concept though, interleaving of absorption and diffusion, 2D towards the front, 3D towards the back, base absorbers towards the corners, it works well. So if you have, if you're a base head like me and you put four corner loaded subs, how much of those corner traps can you eliminate now? Because you've already manipulated the standing waves um, yeah. with active base traps, the subwoofers. Uh, so, so Gene, I actually would love to, with your permission, spend an entire hour talking just about that. Cause okay. that's a, that's a look, that's a base loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> That's a corner loaded question. I will say that you put you put four subwoofers in the bottom of this. So take out these base these base absorbers and put a subwoofer over there and tune them. You can tune them to where you're you've taken care of the region between you know 25 or 30 hertz and about 70 or 80 hertz really nicely with that four uh, yep. um, four subwoofer setup. And we should talk about it. There's still people who feel like, no, that's not right. You shouldn't be radiating bass from behind you, all that stuff. And we should talk about that. Yeah. Uh, but then what happens from 80 hertz on up to three or four or 500 hertz where the other panels take over? You need some kind of bass absorption. So these these guys in the corners are, are doing multiple duty. They're, they're absorbing that base region that I talked about so that the reflection decay time is smooth. And they're also getting rid of some standing waves. Yeah. So guys, I want you to understand that when he says base absorption, he's not just talking about the subwoofer channel 80 Hertz and below. We're actually going up to 300 Hertz, which is right at the room transition frequency. Right. Transit. So you know, what, what is base? I think most people agree that somewhere, somewhere around 250 or 300 Hertz is where we stop talking to base about base. And we start to talk about mids, you know, different people may think of that differently, but yeah, some, somewhere right around there. Mm -hmm. Um, Here's a rendering more photorealistic of what that all looks, that can all look like. And uh, now, uh, so summary of all of this, uh, I'm actually gonna show you one more thing. Uh, sound reflections degrade sound quality and sound staging. Treatments include absorption and diffusion. Now, how do we make all this look good? So this is my, my little you know capstone, all this is you can do all this, you can put all these things on the walls, but it doesn't have to look bad. The trick is to apply stretch fabric, decorative stretch fabric around the room to, to hide all of this. I, I equate that to the hood on a car. What's below the hood for us gearheads is wonderful and beautiful, but you maybe don't want to see it all the time. So this is this is covering all of the, the mechanisms of the room. So put absorbers and diffusers and speakers and wires all over the room and then do stretch fabric treatments on the walls, the ceiling. Um, and what does that look like? Looks like anything you want. How do you do stretch fabric? There's a bunch of different ways to do it. Uh, there's several brands of stretch fabric tracks, pla these plastic tracks that you hire a contractor to come in and put in and they, they stretch the fabric and tuck it all in. Um, this particular brand, I mentioned a little while ago, I had a space out of the brand, it's called Wallmate. Wallmate is one brand that you can just buy directly from the company and you can install it yourself or have somebody who's handy install it. It's kind of cool in that you, you put the thing on the wall or on a, on, a, on a rib to space it out from the wall if you need four or five inches of depth. And then you put the, the fabric on a self-sticky uh, self sticky thing, and then you pull it down. And as you're closing the cleat, it stretches it all in one. So you, you can actually have two left hands and be, you know, really, or that's not fair to left-handed people. You can mm -hmm. actually be not so good with your hands at, you know, making things nice and even, and end up with a result if you're a DIY or a result that looks good. You can also stretch the fabric on frames and click it in with Velcro clips, however you want to do it. Now, the purpose is this. Look at this room. This is this this was actually the first home THX certified room, interestingly enough, in, uh, really? in, in near San Francisco. Yeah. Really? Um, so here's a room. You're seeing the walls. You're seeing a bunch of subwoofers. This room had had uh, uh, four subwoofers in the four midpoints, so 16 subwoofers cranked. The, the purpose of the fabric is to hide all this junk. We think it's beautiful. Most people think it's junk. You hide it with stretch fabric. And if you look carefully, there's these like little, these little white things are the actual track that the fabric gets tucked into. Okay, that's the idea. So then you have a room that's nice and smooth and even. Um, here is a room that we did 
uh, two years ago in the, the San Jose, California area. It's got all of our, it's a full complement of our Gramini system speakers. Um, stretch fabric. This is one way that it can look. The picture actually makes the wood look yellow is actually much more of a natural kind of pine tone, but whatever, that's what it ends up looking like. Um, here's another room, totally different with stretch fabric. So you, you walk into this room and you wouldn't know that it's stretch fabric. You think this is just a beige colored wall. Well, this is fabric. That's fabric. There's some pilasters that there to, to dress it all up. Totally different look to this, right? Um, so, you know, uh, look, looking at all these systems you've done, it's much more difficult to do a theater system that has multiple rows of seats rather than just one row. Several reasons why is it's harder to get good base across multiple rows of seat. And secondly, it's hard to get a good surround effect without hot spotting, you know, like have a one row that's all tuned and, and lined up. And then the rest of the rows are either having a side channel that's too loud or too low. Yeah. So one thing we could do on a future video is talk about what do you do when you have multi-row seating? How do you handle the surround speakers? How do you do multiple side channels or do you even do that? Or you just choose a different type of speaker to get good coverage? That, so that would or, be another good hour to talk about how to widen the, what I call the sweet spot. How do you get all, you know, you and all 10 of your friends to go, man, this is kick ass. Right. Uh, there's a bunch of things you got to do in picking your speakers, doing the acoustics, tuning it. How many speakers, where do you put them? Thanks, Gene. That's a great one. So I just I just signed myself up for um, an entire hour on widening the sweet spot and then an entire hour nice. on you know, what do we do with, with subwoofers and well, tuning well, well, that's super interesting because I'm doing a theater in the third largest house ever built in the United States right now. And I, wow. I incorporated some things I've learned. Yeah. So I've incorporated cool. some tricks that I've learned about dispersion. So that'd be a, that'd be a good. Cool. Well, let's talk about it. So this is a, another room with stretch fabric, totally different looking, um, designed nice. uh, by a female designer for, for a, a female owner, woman owner. Um, Beautiful story. This woman had just recovered from from cancer and and uh, had some beautiful pictures of of the recovery right. phase and just wanted those up there. So uh, this is stretch fabric. That's stretch fabric. The ceiling is stretch fabric, and these are pr are printed panels, acoustically transparent, uh, printed with dye sublimation onto the the fabric. Behind all of this is loudspeakers, subwoofers, absorbers, diffusers, wires. It's all hidden behind there. And this thing that actually looks like a giant TV is not. It's a it's a projection screen that's surrounded by a beautiful inlaid wood frame. Um, totally different room. This is a room we did with uh, together with Theo Kalamarakis, a very well-known designer, a genius. Um, and... Okay. Uh, he uh, he designed a room in, in which the walls actually zig like the this is sort of a sine wave zigzag. In front of them are these light light columns that are made out of micro perforated metal with some gauze in them. They're actually acoustically transparent. This room was for a very 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 famous actor, which will go unnamed, um, and uh, absolutely loved it. Uh, it started off actually it was an expansion of a room that was way too small for this guy's big guy. Um, and we were brought in to try to replace the sound system. It's like, this is way too small. And we convinced them to, to extend the room, extend the house, dig down. Um, did this together with um, a company out of Los Angeles called Future Home. Hi, Murray, if you're listening. Uh, great result. Uh, different room, uh, different style. Again, stretch fabric. So this is fabric, fabric, fabric. Uh, these are wood uh, wood sections. They're micro perforated over here and striped perforated over there. This is all hiding speakers, treatments, etc. Um, this Beautiful. is a Cedia Award winning room from two. See, I love that LED backlight on the uh, surrounding the screen. That's awesome. Yeah. All on the edges. Very very cool. Very very simple. Son, we got to do that. Modern. Uh, this matched yeah. the modern nature of the room. What we did is we held very back cool. the fabric at a certain height here and and downlit it and then lit around there. Uh, just, you know, these rooms all look different. And when you walk in this room, if you didn't know, you yeah. would not know it's fabric. Here's another room. This is obviously fabric. And this is what the client wanted. They wanted just like a very clean look with a, with a lot of structure to the fabric. And this is a wild and crazy room uh, that yeah. we did again with Theo Kalamarakis yeah. and Steve Haas, yeah. uh, award winning several years ago. And you go, what's all this? Well, this is fabric, acoustic heat transparent, more acoustical transparency, and you know you you can you can do things uh, just just knowing that you're 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 trying to create a porous envelope around your room so that it looks amazing, um, and you got to get creative and you can make it look the right way and have the right acoustics. 
Awesome. I love seeing that. You know, we should just do a video one time on um, before and afters on rooms that yeah, you've done. Uh, most of these projects yeah, I've theaters got that you've along done. the way. I mean, so. very cool. I mean, you know, Anthony has dominated in theaters he's designed with every year in our industry. There's always awards on the most innovative and best theaters chosen by peers and professionals in the industry. And Anthony, you've pretty much dominated that. I mean, I know Theo's done a lot of great decorative stuff, but you've that you've owned that category. Yeah. Um, that, thankfully, uh, there's also other good designers. Just you know, because I like to play fair. There's well, other people that have gotten really, really good awards too for rooms that are great. When Theo's involved, the room is going to look awesome because he is just a complete genius. Um, his, you know, his his yeah. side is not the acoustics engineering, but but the vision of like making it look great. Uh, we're more acoustic geeks. We have some idea of what looks good, but you know, right. he's the master of that. So, uh, so let me share your. Let me share. Uh, your these are my coordinates, uh, email address, and the websites for the stuff that I'm doing these days. Oops, I um, the wrong one. Feel free to reach out. Um, some people are actually emailing the info lines. It's fine. Uh, somebody will will catch it. Uh, but you know, either email me or or go to the info or or help lines on these things. Um, so what do you do if you want to learn more about this? There are some really well-written books on this stuff. Here is one set of, of wonderful resources. If you want to learn more about acoustics, um, you know, starting with this amazing book called the master handbook of acoustics by, uh, great F Alton Everest. Um, Bible. absolutely, absolutely Bible. great book. It's got, it's in seventh edition now. Um, here's how much I, Here's how much I think this is an amazing book. I my son's middle name is Alton. Okay, <laughs> um, so uh, more it. resources. Also, a great book on on absorbers and diffusers by uh, Peter D'Antonio and Trevor Cox. And you know the list goes on. And then this is an absolute must-have. Uh, Floyd Tool, Doctor Floyd Tool wrote. Um, I, I I think I wrote this as a third edition. I think there's maybe an even newer edition. I, mm -hmm. I forget now. But he wrote an amazing book on all of the topics I covered over here. You can read all about the stuff if you're interested in geeking out or, or watch more of these webinars. Awesome. Well, we went over our hour, you know, hour and 16 minutes here, and we still have the retention of our viewers. That's amazing. And it's 1230 at night pretty much. So I think we're wrapped up. Uh, Anthony, thanks again for dropping some knowledge here, recapping everything we've done over. We've been doing this now for over a month. So, you know, this is a regular thing. And always happy to have both of you guys on here to talk room acoustics. And I think we're going to start branching this off into other topics as well. I mean, I came up with a couple just tonight with the bass thing and then widening the sweet spot, I think is going to be a huge thing that we should be covering because you don't hear anybody talking about that. And most right. people are setting right. up everything you read about. It's even Adobe, all the Adobe diagrams show one listener with all the speakers around them. That's, right? that's I mean, not home theater. Home theater is a thing you enjoy. No. You enjoy with others and and uh, you know i hear people right. going i don't want to be locked in my room on my own i want I, you want all the scenes to sound, see it sound good i want the picture to be good and uh it to, to sound great have good intelligibility everywhere so yeah it's it's a it's a joint yeah. experience people so. adhere to those guidelines too much i mean there there is quite a bit of flexibility involved in that depending on the room and the deployment of the speakers i mean that's something that's going to be exciting to cover i mean we've even talked about in some of the forums on facebook anthony so right right Okay. All right, guys. Well, we are it's done for the for, night. It's time for chocolate. <laughs> I'm going to get some. <laughs> Always time for chocolate. All right, guys. So don't Please. forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. I'll be putting up this um, P P P PowerPoint presentation that uh, we just went over. If you guys want to go into more detail on that. Uh, Anthony, thanks. Don as well. And until next Always. time, my friends, keep listening.